Yeah, thank you for having me here. So, circular extrachromosomal DNA in, child, uh, in, in general has attracted quite some attention during the last couple of years. So, I have nothing, nothing to disclose. So, in 2019, the New York Times actually had an article on uh, these, how they call it, mysterious DNA circles, and that they are much more common in cancer than we originally thought. And uh, maybe we just take that moment to take a look at the actual picture here, right, where we uh, see a metaphase spread of a glioblastoma cancer cell line, and we see all the normal chromosomes um, or a couple of them at least. But then when you look closely, you see all these additional pieces of DNA that float around the, the nucleus and form circles, right? And they are there in, in relatively high copy numbers, right? We are looking at 20, 30, or even higher uh, copy numbers of these oncogenes. And these ECDNA particles were actually already observed in the, in the 60s when they were originally called double minutes, right? Because they like to tend to be together, but they don't always be uh, together. They can be singular ECDNA particles, and this is why the term circular extrachromosomal DNA has been uh, uh, introduced. Um, however, due to more recent studies, we now know that these ECDNAs are not just random DNA uh, circles, but that they are relatively large with an average of 1.2, 1.3 million base pairs, and they uh, uh, they harbor lots of uh, oncogenes, typically well-known oncogenes, as well as non-coding regulatory DNA or en enhancers. So, um, yeah, I mean, just maybe to put it also into the context of the previous talk, right? I personally see these ECDNAs as a very specific form of a structural variant, right? Where a cancer cell has found a way to um, produce and transcribe very high copy numbers uh, of, of an oncogene, right? However, um, ECDNA, they do have a couple of very unique properties that we are just recently starting to understand, right? For example, extra chromosomal DNA, unlike chromosomal DNA, is not always divided equally among the daughter cells uh, during the cell division, right? Due to the lack of a centromere, um, these circle, circular pieces of DNA are being distributed unevenly among the daughter cells, some daughter cells receive more ECDNA, which they then continue to duplicate and, and inherit. And because this inherit, inheritance is basically a random uh, process, uh, this can result in, in great heterogeneity with, uh, of ECDNA copy number within, a, within a, a tumor, right? Some of our preliminary data also indicates that ECDNA in some cases undergoes uh, quite severe molecular evolution in terms of ECDNA sequence, in terms of the oncogenes that they carry. Uh, sometimes we observe in the relapse case additional oncogenes on, on the ECDNA, but also in terms of uh, copy numbers. So taken together, um, I think um, these ECDNA elements uh, are really a major contributor to uh, intratumoral heterogeneity and maybe even a reason for the emergence of therapy resistance in some high-risk um, tumors. It has also been shown that the circular nature of ECDNA can enable aberrant gene enhancer interactions, right? Similarly to the enhancer hijacking events that were discussed just in the talk before, right? Here in this case, it is thought that the circular nature of the ECDNA can lead to aberrant gene enhancer interactions uh, that would normally not occur in normal tumors shown, uh, sorry, in normal cells in the normal DNA uh, on, on the left. And uh, it has been um, suggested and also functionally validated that these enhancer rewiring events leads to an increase of the oncogene transcription on top of the already very high copy numbers of the, of the oncogenes um, on the ECDNA. Then it has been postulated that uh, the enhancers on the ECDNA not only activate genes on uh, co-amplified on the ECDNA, but that they work at uh, so-called mobile transcriptional enhancers that can get in contact with all kinds of normal chromosomes and thereby enhance um, transcription uh, in trans. And it has also been described that ECDNA like to come together and form ECDNA hubs and that the formation of these ECDNA hubs even further enhances oncogene expression. And this is an example where ECDNA hubs um, have recently been 
discussed as a novel therapeutic target because they might be more sensitive for inhibitors of co-activators like uh, BRD4. And that uh, basically brings me to an important point I would like to stress, because I think one of the reasons that uh, ECDNA uh, is creating such an enthusiasm lately is um, the idea that uh, there might be um, a therapeutic opportunity that targets properties of the ECDNA itself instead of targeting the co-amplified oncogenes, right? So ideally there would be a single drug that improves the clinical outcome of uh, any tumor that harbors ECDNA, right? And uh, there are a couple of potential strategies that are being discussed in the literature at the moment, right? Properties um, that have been associated with ECDNA genesis, with the idea of blocking the ECDNA specific replication, blocking ECDNA clustering and, and, and other uh, hypotheses that uh, are out there. So I think it's fair to ask why ECDNA is only now getting such an attention when major international cancer genome consortia have generated whole genome sequencing data sets across many different uh, cancer types for, for many, many years, right? And that includes the TCGA, the ICGC, but also more recent studies um, where uh, this Peacock Consortium analyzed uh, whole genome sequencing data sets that were published in 2020. Interestingly, the analysis of ECDNA has been largely neglected. And the reasons for this are, I think, partly because the computational methods for reconstruction, for reconstructing ECDNA from cancer genome sequencing data have only recently been developed, but also because I think the prevalence and uh, the, yeah, the frequency and the importance of ECDNA in tumors has been just largely underestimated. And that actually also applies to a pan-cancer study across childhood cancers that we published in 2018. And even though we looked at many different aspects of cancer genomics here, we totally overlooked the analysis of extra chromosomal DNA. And that was the reason why a few years ago, I of course started to wonder what is the uh, frequency, how abundant are uh, ECDNA, and what is the clinical impact of ECDNA uh, in the many different types of childhood cancers. And uh, instead of relying on our previously assembled cohort, uh, I thought it made a lot of sense to draw on these new, new resources that have been developed and made available in recent years, right? And as you all know, cancer genomics data and cancer analytics is moving into the cloud, right? So instead of downloading the data onto our compute servers, we then decided to wrap our tools. In this case, it was the tool Amplicon Architect, which is actually the tool that reconstructs ECDNA based on whole genome sequencing data. We wrap Amplicon Architect into these Docker containers. And then uh, the beauty of these Docker containers is that they come with all the dependent software, right? With all the dependencies and the additional tools that you need, and you can basically run them on different uh, platforms. Um, so, I mean, the idea just to bring the software to the data and not the other way around anymore, right? So this is what we did. We were looking into, on the one hand, into the uh, Sanjut cloud that holds a huge amount of whole genome sequencing data. And we, of course, also leveraged uh, uh, the Kids First data resource um, repository uh, and the Kavatika uh, infrastructure here, right? So. Um, this allowed us to analyze all the whole genome sequencing data that is out there um, remotely and then download the, the results for an integrative analysis across platforms, right? So we first decided to focus on medulloblastoma um, because, as you know, it's one of the most frequent uh, childhood brain tumors. And as you all know, there are at least these four major molecular subgroups of medulloblastoma, each enriched with different types of mutations, structural rearrangements, and each subgroup is associated with different clinical characteristics, such as overall survival. So in total, we had access to whole genome sequencing data of about 460 medulloblastoma patients. This includes, as I said, whole genome sequencing data available at the St. Jude, at the uh, Kids First repository, the TCGA, but also newly uh, whole genome sequencing data generated from patients treated at uh, the Brady Children's Hospital in San Diego, um, uh, where I got access with the help of, of Rob Vexlarea who also presented earlier today. So as a result, we find ECDNA in 18% of all medulloblastoma patients. By subgroup, we find no ECDNA in patients um, uh, of the WIND subgroup. Um, 
which yeah, notably also have the best prognosis. In the subgroup Sonic Hedgehog, group three and group four, we find a proportion of 14 to 27% of tumors with EC DNA, with the largest proportion of 27% uh, of cases in the Sonic Hedgehog subgroup, and only because uh, we discussed uh, germline a lot uh, earlier today. I would like to mention that we do find a very significant association of TP53, either somatic or also germline um, variants uh, in the Sonic Hedgehog subgroups with the occurrence of um, ECDNA. In other words, whenever, almost in all cases where we see ECDNA, we also see a TP53 alterations, but only specifically in the Sonic Hedgehog. We don't see that in the group three and in the group four. There must be other mechanisms. The histogram at the bottom just shows a, a histogram as a, or the, a list of all the genes that we find commonly amplified on ECDNA. And uh, many of these are known metalloblastoma oncogenes like the MIG family and GLE2 transcription factors, the TER telomerase or CDK6 uh, cell cycle regulators. And when we distinguish between tumors with and without ECDNA, we find that metalloblastoma patients with ECDNA are more than twice as likely to relapse and uh, more than three times as likely to die from the disease within five years of diagnosis. And that actually also holds true when we further stratify the medulloblastoma patients into the molecular subgroups, Sonic Hedgehog, group three and group four. So I think identifying a medulloblastoma tumor to have ECDNA seems to be a, a good biomarker for poor outcome. And as I said, the challenge or the opportunity here is uh, really to identify vulnerabilities that specifically target the characteristics of ECDNA, not necessarily the oncogenes amplified on ECDNA, but target to target the molecular mechanisms that uh, interfere with the generation, the maintenance, uh, and the replication of circular extra chromosomal DNA. Um, so the field is catching up, right? There have been few studies uh, lately published as, as of today. And um, uh, this is the, the landscape of different tumor types that have been analyzed for uh, ECDNA. Uh, there was a recent pan cancer study looking in all the uh, TCGA uh, data. And then there are individual studies, a very pioneering study in neuroblast tumors that came out uh, two years ago. We know uh, the ECDNA status in Ewing sarcoma and also in medulloblast tumor, but um, because there are so many more childhood cancer types, as I said at the beginning, we continue to, to analyze uh, the large cross-cancer cohorts uh, for the um, frequency of ECDNA. Even though our results are still uh, preliminary, I just wanted to at least give you a brief overview of uh, different cancer types in our cohort that we have processed uh, so far that uh, also includes many different uh, childhood brain tumors. Right here, we on the one hand recapitulate what has been already uh, and publish what is already known about ECDNA and medulloblastoma and neuroblastoma. But in addition, we find, uh, we identify and profile ECDNA in, in many other tumor types, including a large fraction of the pediatric high grade gliomas, osteosarcomas, right? Maybe one point I want to stress we clearly don't see ECDNA everywhere. For example, the ependymoma is another tumor type that we analyze in my lab. Uh, we only find, I think, two cases with uh, ECDNA, and those are spinal um, ependymomas with MIG-N amplifications that be behave very poorly that have been described lately. But all the intracranial ependymomas, we do not see any ECDNA. Um, so it's, of course, only a, a, a fraction of the tumors seem to uh, harbor ECDNA. But then again, when we look at uh, the survival data, identifying uh, tumors, even across the pan cancer cohort that we're analyzing here, really uh, shows a poor clinical outcome that is associated with the presence and the high copy numbers of these ECDNA in, in, in these tumors. So as a summary, one minute, perfect. Um, ECDNA is a frequent and potent driver uh, of, seems, seems to be a frequent and potent driver of poor outcome in medulloblastoma and other cancers. And um, we are actively we and others, of course, are actively uh, analyzing mechanisms that lead to the, to the formation of ECDNA. We also uh, continue to look at the molecular evolution during disease progression and would like to test that uh, under therapeutic pressure. We use novel single cell sequencing and imaging technologies here. And again, I think there is this challenge out there to find new therapeutic opportunities um, targeting ECDNA. And with that, I would like to thank uh, all the people involved, especially my, my team at UC San Diego and all the collaborators. And of course, I would like to thank you for your attention.